we're going to now enter into something very simple, but that is going to be the foundation for how to interpret. How to interpret, not just the Bible, by the way. We started off, remember, with the first word. We said, the good news is that we all know how to interpret. So I'm not going to teach you how to interpret. You already know. What I'm going to teach you maybe is if you need to do some correction in the way you're thinking. Because you're thinking. You know how to think, common sense. But sometimes we are also discover why is it that sometimes we don't get it. All right, so what do we learn? What is the main point? How do we learn the basic principle of interpretation? Okay, so what is it? Where does the meaning of a text come from? Look at that image. Two people are doing the same thing, right? The guy in the coat. And the tie, what is he saying? Now, it's interesting. If I showed that in an audience in America, they would not have said out. And they'll wonder what you are meaning by that. Do you realize what you understand that a common American audience will not get? What is it? You are thinking what? Cricket. And that's not a common game in America. And so the same action, the meaning is different. The umpire in a cricket field behind the wickets, he says, you're out. But the other one looks like a preacher, right? He's holding his Bible and lifts. What do you think he's saying? Well, depends, right? <laughs> yeah, the, again, one God or there's one way or look to God or he's the way or something, right? Do you realize they both have the same non-verbal action, but the meanings are different? Where do meanings come from? Next. So, what do we learn? We can have a word which can have multiple meanings in different contexts. Look at the word sink, for example. What does that mean? It can be a verb. It can be your bathroom sink. Right? Or the word bow. It can be bow and arrow or the bow you have on your neck. Every place, words have multiple meanings. There is no one meaning to one word, and that's why translation becomes a challenge when you translate even one word for something. Let me ask you a question. You've heard this Greek word agape? you heard that. There are organizations called agape, etc. What is the meaning of agape? Unconditional love of God. That's a good answer. Not the right answer. Agape means love. It doesn't always have to mean God's love. John 3.16, the verb is used, agapao. It'll say, God so loved the world. It's the verb. Agape is a noun. Verb agapao is used. Wonderful. So it is, you can say, unconditional. But three verses down, 3.19, the people loved darkness. Guess what? That's the same verb, agapao. So that's not unconditional God's love, divine love. Words have meaning only in their context. There's no fixed meaning to one word anyway. And so that's when we realize that we use words in different ways. Next, what we need to see is therefore, what is the key? What is the key? And it's something that everyone knows. But when it comes to the Bible, we miss it. Somehow, what we are told, for example, if I just tell you, you know, I am going to show you a beautiful cloud formation. Just come out, I am going to show you. Just look at the clouds. They are in the beautiful shape of an elephant. I tell you that, then I take you out, what will you see? Elephant. You'll see that. I've told you that. And if you are looking carefully, you say, I'm not sure it looks like an elephant. It looks like a horse to me. Then you are looking. You are not just 
allowing somebody to tell you what it is. But very many times we are taught something from childhood sometimes, and not bad things, it's not necessarily bad things, but differently. And so we need to realize context is the key. So if we make the mistake of just pulling a verse from the Bible, sometimes we may get the context, and other times we may miss the context. And the message is always richer with the context. That's God's intention. Do you realize God did not give us a sack full of verses cut up and you just carry that sack, shake it up, once in a while take out a few verses like lucky dip? Some Christians play lucky dip. I'll say a few words about lucky dip later on. Can God not speak to us like that? We'll answer that question. So, here is a little uh, humorous statement that uh, somebody said, I can do all things through a verse taken out of context. Whatever you want to do, you can do it. You can do all things. And that's what, sometimes if I have been taught that way, I remember many years ago, I was 18, and somebody told me, Revelation 11, it's about television. The two witnesses are di dying there. The whole world sees. How can the whole world see? Through television, right? And imagine, so many years ago, I told my class, this is the proof that the Bible is the word of God. Bible is talking about television. Now, if I was living 100 years earlier, could I have used that as a proof of the Bible? Or 200 years earlier? No, no television. So then what do you do with that verse? It has nothing to do with television. It's written in the first century. They understood it. We have to figure out what did they understand. That's our problem. So, very, very important to recognize. So what is the main principle? One way to put it is like this. We have to discover the author's intended meaning. It's there in your notes, right? Author's intended meaning. So, Paul has written something in Philippians, right? He has said so many things, and at the end of that, he says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I tell my students, when you are preaching from Paul, imagining that Paul is sitting there, and then you preach away, and after the service, wait for him to come to you and say, huh, Pastor Jacob, that's nice. Very good. You preach from... You know that letter? I wrote it. <laughs> okay. Now, did you read it? <gasps> I preached from it, but did I read it? See, sometimes if you just read 4.13, you may have missed what Paul meant. So you have to find out what the author meant. And it's not difficult. It's not rocket science. Every one of us here is intelligent enough to understand the meaning. If we keep what in mind? Context. And the other thing we need to ask, another, by the way, I am using an acronym here, A-I-M. What is it? Author's Intended Meaning. It's a simple acronym. I'm using it also in another way. Audience's Inducted Meaning. Meaning, what did the original audience understand, not you. Paul does not know you or me. We may know a little bit about Paul. He doesn't know you. He wrote the letter Philippians to whom? To a church in Philippi, his beloved church. And he wants to say something important to them. We get to listen to him or read what he's telling them. And we believe that God is going to use Philippians to speak to us too. Through the writing of Paul, though he's writing to them. So very important, we discover what the text meant to them. Then we ask the next question, what the text means to us. And that's not the same. When Paul is saying something to them, Maybe some things are for them. When he tells Timothy, you bring my coat, are you going to look for Paul's coat? No, obviously not. So it was to them. 
from the message to them, we now grapple with and say, okay, so now how does it apply to us? What it meant and now what it means. This is like, remember in chemistry in school, you used to have something called a litmus test? You remember that? What was litmus test? Any science teachers or... Huh? Yeah, so it's a little piece of paper. You put it in and the moment you take it out, we have a scientist sitting there and uh, very simple. It'll tell you whether the solution is acidic or alkaline. Simple, very simple test. This is like a litmus test. Ask a simple question. Could Paul, if you're reading Paul, have meant this? Or reading Revelation. Revelation 11. Did the writer John, he calls himself John, mean this television, computers, COVID, this, Pope? Or did the first century audience or second century audience understand television, computers? This is a litmus test. If not, then that is not the meaning of that text. Simple. Very simple. Now, once we understand what that text means, what is the next thing we do? We then struggle with, okay, so I know I'm not living in Corinth or in Philippi. What do I learn from Paul's letter to them? Because God is speaking through that something and we need to work at the application. All right, so now you may ask me a question. Pastor Jacob, are you saying, uh, you know, we get these let, uh, verses every day and sometimes I open the Bible and God spoke to me from a verse, right? Has that happened? Does it happen? Of course, is that possible? Yes, I know I want to give you one simple good one that I recently came across. And here is a story about a man called John Lawson. John Lawson, uh, uh, he was a criminal. He was in... Um, prison and uh, when he was in prison one of the prisoners uh, a fellow prisoner told him you come to the church John Lawson didn't believe in God he went through a very terrible life and uh, he gave him a Bible and he opened the Bible guess what the text he got Ezekiel 18 it says if a wicked man turn from his wicked ways imagine he just opened and that's the verse he saw and then he went back the next meeting. He said, first I went to have the cake and coffee. But now this verse opens and it touches him and he goes. It's a wonderful uh, testimony. You write that uh, name down and you can listen to him on YouTube, his testimony. Amazing. Wonderful man of God. Now, preaching the gospel, etc. So can God sometimes do that? Mm, of course, God does that. Another famous story in the history of Christianity is the story of Augustine. You've heard of St. Augustine? Yeah. And Augustine was struggling. He was a brilliant man, philosopher and all that, but also living a very immoral life. He was struggling. And one day, and he came across the gospel and he was struggling with that. One day, he, he was in the garden and it happened to be he had a writing of Romans with him. And he heard a voice. It seemed like the voice of a girl playing some game next door. And it said, take up and read. That's what he heard. So he saw this writing and he opened it. And he turned, it was to Romans chapter 13, verse 13 and 14. Give up your carnal ways. And that kind of clear verse was there. It was like, boom, he got it. So, can God use that? That kind of, sure. Sure, God can. But please understand, those are exceptions. That's not every day you're going to find. Do I go left or right? Do I pick up this job, A or B? Mm, I'm not sure whether you'll always find if you just open the Bible like Lucky Dip. That's what you do when you go on the streets of India. You will see somebody sitting there with a little bird, green bird in their little cat, and you go and give a little money, they will tell you how, much, how many questions you want to ask. Depending on that, they'll ask you money. And the bird comes out and pulls out one card. We don't use the Bible that way. 
So we use the Bible in context, right? Is that clear? All right. We'll have time for Q&A. Please don't uh, worry about that. We will give time for that very soon. So what is, what am I talking about? A, B, C, and D. Apples, bananas, coconuts. What is all this all about? It's basically about context. What is the key to understanding anything? Context. Whether it's my wife saying something in the kitchen, I need to hear all what she says to understand who is she talking about. And I give an answer, she says, I'm talking about this. Oh, sorry, I thought you were talking about this. So I don't get that. But I'm intelligent enough if I listen to her carefully, which I do once in a while, um, then I can understand. Any careful reader of the Bible, not verses, will understand. So what I'm going to take you through quickly now, so that we don't spend too much time, is to show you from these very well-known passages how possibly sometimes we have missed the main point. We may not do too much damage to what we are doing, unlike what we talked about, that Kenyan cult that killed so many people. There was another famous case many years ago, a guy called Jim Jones. Have you heard that guy? And he was a very popular preacher in California. He managed to, and once a group of people believe that this man is, you know, the right person, God is speaking through them, then they suspend judgment. And he told them that they need to move, God is telling him to move from California. They went all the way down to South America and lived in the jungles. And then one day he said, God has told me that we all must go to him. And he had this big, big jar or vessel where he put cyanide. 900 people died. Today we have a saying, you know, drink, they have drunk the Kool-Aid. Use that idiom. So many intelligent people, they committed suicide. Just like what happened recently in Kenya. So the moment you suspend your own judgment and you say, God is speaking through this man and we give too much authority to one person, you are in danger. That's how cults are formed. That's how cults are formed. So we need to understand that we read the text always in context. And to help us that way, I have kind of decided to help you look at it from three levels of context. So now you look at this diagram. This diagram is showing you three levels of context. It's there in your notes, right? The first level, this is what I call the apple level. How do you eat an apple? Once it's clean, you just look around, make sure there's no worm coming out from this side or whatever. And you just look around, right? You don't close your eyes and eat. And then you eat. That's it. So when you're reading, where two or three gather in my name, that's Matthew 18, 20. Why don't you start reading from before you got there? How did you get there? How do you read a book, by the way, a storybook? You turn to page 18 and read one line. And then you turn to page 45 and read one line. That's how you read a storybook? No, you will, you will only misunderstand it. Why do we read the Bible that way? Is it a magical book that every verse has equal power and strength? No, obviously not. One of the examples I like to give is, and it can be shocking to people is, in the book of Job, it's a very unusual book. It's not a regular kind of story, but it's a very powerful story. What is it about? You know, a main character is Job and his friends. How many friends? Three plus one, yes. Three plus one. And these three guys are great theologians. But the best thing they do as a good pastor is kept quiet for some time. You know? And that's something my children say I must learn how to listen also. And so they listened for a few days. After that, they spoke and gave him why he's suffering, right? And their main answer was, you have done, you look like you are a nice guy, but we know you cannot have these problems unless you're a bad guy. And they have all these chapters, three friends, they give reasons why he's suffering. And what does Job do? Does he accept what they say? He fights back. No way. You're wrong. 
and then it goes on and on and on. At the end, you have God appearing to Job and speaking to Job. It's an amazing kind of writing. And then what does the character of God say in chapter 42? He tells those guys, what you said is stupid. I'm really mad with you guys. You better ask Job to pray for you. Correct? Now, what do you do with all those chapters? Read it carefully. Because then you realize how we people think. Not every verse and every line is stupid there, okay? It's like doing an algebra sum. You have 10 steps. You can have five right. But even one is wrong, boom, everything goes wrong. Correct? Huh. So we learn to read texts carefully. So, shall we eat some apples? Come, let's eat some apples. Very simple. Apple is just look around. Look around the verse. The first example is Philippians 4, 13. And just to save on time, we will not open our Bibles because you know it and you can look at it later on. But Paul begins talking about in this section. Read from verse 10 onwards. Now, by the way, let me also say this. One of the things that good modern translations do is try to help you by putting paragraphs. But if you're reading a King James or a New King James Bible, you have a limitation. I would rather call it a weakness. But there are people who will die for King James, New King James. I will say the limitation is every verse is a separate paragraph. Now, do you realize the problem with that? What if that paragraph, that verse, is only one-fifth of a sentence? And you're running with that one verse. That's why modern translations say, it looks like this is one section. Read it together. Think in paragraphs. I have nothing against you if you are reading the New King James or King James. Please do that. But remember, that's not how Paul wrote. Okay. So when you read the paragraph, Paul says, I have learned the secret of being content in all situations, whether well-fed or hungry. And then he says, I can do all this through the one who strengthens me. So it's not about, I can become the prime minister of India. I can become the fastest runner on the world. I can become the greatest cricketer in the world. No, this verse is not talking about that. You cannot do all things. We know that. We cannot do so many things I can't do. Maybe you can do all things. No, we can't. The all does not mean all. But a preacher can find a, this verse so good. He can say, brother, my Bible says all. Does your Bible say all? <laughs> all means all. Sounds nice. Hallelujah. You get excited. But the problem is all means what Paul means. Correct, not what you mean. Now, always imagine Paul is sitting there. After you finish, he's going to come and chat with you and say, ah, nice. Did you read my letter? So, context. Simple. Now, is it difficult to understand that? No. So simple. The next example, very well known. John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. And now, yes, we may think Satan. Yes, Satan is called a thief in other places, but not here. In this context, the NIV will say, verse 1 will say, now Jesus said, you Pharisees, the thief comes not through the gate. So the thief will not come through the main gate because there is some security there. So, then verse 7, he will say, I am the gate. So that means if you're not coming through me, Jesus says, you are a thief. So then when he comes to chapter 10, verse 10, A, he says, the thief comes to steal, to kill and destroy. Who is he referring to? But I am the good shepherd, right? He will talk about that. So this story is going back to many passages in the Old Testament where God is the good shepherd, right? Especially Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34 is a, is a beautiful background for this chapter where God says, you know, to the leaders of Israel, you are terrible shepherds, selfish, vicious. 
You don't take care of my sheep. So I am going to come down myself. I will come down myself. That's the promise in Ezekiel 34. And so when Jesus comes and says, I am the good shepherd, you know what? He's, he's fulfilling that promise of God promising I. So who is the thief here? The evil or bad religious shepherds, Pharisees and others in that context. Not about Satan. Now, is Satan a thief? Yes, but not in this place. This is not about Satan, the thief. The next verse, quickly, we look at is, um, yes, Matthew 18, verse 20. Where two or three gather in my name. It's very interesting. We read that only when we have six, seven people for prayer. We comfort ourselves, right? <laughs> Even though there are seven of us, we can still, Jesus is with us. But 700, we don't need that. We somehow feel, yeah, Jesus is with us. Please read the passage. Matthew 18, verse 15 onwards. It says, now if your brother or sister sins, hmm, you go and talk to them individually. Tell them, brother, sister, you are on a dangerous path. Please stop it. Come back. He says, if you can do it, and if they listen, wonderful. But if they don't listen, you can't just let them go. You take one or two people with you. Now, how, how many have you become? Two or three. Eh. And talk to them. Now, they don't listen. You know why? Because you need witnesses. Now, you have to tell the church. You can't just go and make a complaint against uh, some brother and you need some witnesses. So what happens? Now you have three witnesses, two or three. And it's all about disciplining of your fellow brother and sister. Why? Because you love them. Not because you hate them and you want to discipline them. It's because you love them. And then Jesus says, when you are having this meeting of disciplining your brother or sister, I am with you. Pastor, I like to use this verse when I pray in a prayer meeting. Please use it. It's okay. But it's not about prayer meeting. You, I hope there will be a lot of prayer when you gather to discipline somebody. Because we need to. But this is not about, just about prayer. Now comes to that passage where Jesus said, All these things will be added to you. Ah, preachers enjoy this. God has called you to have all things. You know, you are uh, God's children, embassy. In fact, sometimes they will say, you know, we have, uh, I heard a preacher during COVID who I won't mention which country and which preacher, but he said, we are God's embassy. We are royal people. So we have diplomatic immunity, it seems, <laughs> against COVID. Diplomatic immunity. And his crowd of thousands of people were cheering, saying hallelujah. I don't know what he did when somebody from his congregation died by COVID. Did he go for the funeral? Did he take back his words? I don't know. Because we use words and say, all these things are for you. So I want to buy the most expensive car on the streets of Bangalore. God wants me because I am, after all, child of the king, correct? Yeah, just talk to Paul before you say that. Get, just talk with Apostle Paul for a minute about your view about that. So what does all mean here? It means what it means in the context. And what is the context? We're just reading verses. If you read the previous verses, Jesus has only spoken about two things. Food and clothing. Not even shelter. There is no guarantee that all of God's people will have houses of their own. Now, if you have a house of your own, that's a bonus. Many of God's people died without having a house of their own. So it's not a big deal. Paul did not have a house of his own. He had friends' houses. Jesus did not have a house of his own. He said, foxes have holes. I don't even have a house. So you are better off than Jesus, okay? If you have your own house. This passage is not about all these things. God wants you to have the most expensive car and wear the most expensive clothes. I heard of a preacher and I did not hear that preacher, but I, somebody told me. A preacher was, you know, saying how much God has blessed him. I don't even wear the same shirt again. Wow. Only once. Because so many shirts, right? So many people give him shirts. Nice. It's not here, but. All right. Let's go to the next verse. 
we are just reading the text we are not even trying to find any deep meaning or anything it's just the text what was the next one who was the wisest man now i've given you <laughs> i have given you a lot of references there and the answer is very simple whoever it is but is not solomon read the whole story friends just read the whole story if you define wisdom that you made one or two good choices in life but made every other major choice a terrible choice you don't qualify as a wise man solomon is a poster boy to help us understand wisdom but it's not him will you call a man who collects thousand women like some people collect coins and stamps no he collected thousand women you'll call him wise you will you call somebody wise who goes and dedicates temples to pagan gods where they sacrifice children just because he also dedicated the temple is all that other things all his stupidities washed off not by the bible so learn to read the whole bible don't just go with one story you learned in sunday school he was very wise i like that story you know the story is god appears to him in some form and says what do you want what did he say i want yeah if if i am praying alone in my room and jesus walks in and says jacob he'll probably call me by my pet name and says what do you want what will i say what will i say All I want is you Lord is you Lord all I want is you That's what I'll say But what do I really want Let a camera follow me 24 hours for the next one month and then look at the footage you will know what I want It's not what I sing when I gather in church correct Ah. So wisdom. What is wisdom? Yes. Next, you have a question. Yeah. Who was the wisest man? I'll tell you who are the wisest women. There are more women in our churches in many of our churches. And there are more wise women in our churches today than that man. Who really fear the Lord because Proverbs says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So people who really fear the Lord and I tell you through the centuries many of God's people are far wiser than Solomon. He was intelligent. Intelligence is not wisdom. He didn't use it. All right. I know it's kind of shocking as we like to say is wisest man may be the wisest fool. Mark chapter 10 verse 25 Jesus said it is easier for a camel to go through a eye of a needle so what is that it is what we call a hyperbole sometimes to make a point what is a hyper huper above like in hindi you have the word upar you speak exaggerated extreme to make a point what is the point it is very hard for rich people to trust god very hard You know what happens is people come to church and their maybe salary is small and then they hear some teaching on tithing they say okay ah uh, then they will ask the wife do we give tithe before tax or after tax <laughs> yeah i have been asked to settle that problem between husband and wives and they take me out and they say come on jakey tell us do we give tithes before tax or after tax she is struggling <laughs> yeah and so they want me to give an answer obviously they disagree and my answer is wrong question because we don't understand love giving is out of love i go to buy some flowers for my wife i look at some flowers and say wow what are these flowers sir these are very special they are not cheap i said how much is it is 50 rupees each rose oh 50 okay how much is this 5 which one do i buy love does not calculate but 
suddenly now you get a salary increase and you get like five times your salary <gasps> now giving that tithe becomes more difficult it's hard to trust in god that's the point jesus is making the next one yeah this is a nice one i want you to open your bibles for this please this is a well known sunday school story remember this story the the widow who gave those two coins turn to gospel of mark and uh, chapter 12 very interesting remind yourself there are no chapter divisions remind yourself there are no verse divisions remind yourself there are no headings like in your bible okay so you have a heading and what happens is you read only after the heading please look at the verse before that verses 38 onward jesus said watch out for those rascals teachers of the law they like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the market places and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets they was 40 what do they do devour widows houses and for a show make lengthy prayers these men will be punished most severely then mark says jesus sat down opposite this so the story is a continuation mark has put this story after the words of jesus a widow who comes whose house has been devoured you see that what who has devoured our house her own people her own religious leaders how do you devour somebody's house this morning i ate a little breakfast how do they have a widow's house for breakfast well they come maybe to the widow and say sister we know we are struggling you have four children you know it's not easy the education things we'll help you with a loan uh, only thing is you know i have nothing no no you have this house right you can sign this house and you know the rest of the story that's how they devour widows houses so this story is about the sad reality what is it the leaders and the community have failed to care for the poor in their own community remember the teacher of the scribes very clear in the old testament we have teaching how to take care of people in the community the tithes in the old testament were for three groups of people they were not only for revites they were also for the poor in within the community and thirdly poor outside of their israelite community foreigners tithing is to take care of yes the needs of the church but also the needs of poor within the community and the needs of people outside of the faith community that's what tithes are very clear in the old testament so how come a widow in israel is having this condition how come because the community has failed these leaders have failed instead they are busy greedy taking money for themselves so this story is not about giving all because none of us gives all when i come to church on sunday i put a love offering i i give to my church where i am a member but i don't go back and say i've given everything because this widow gave everything i we have no food for my children no money for education no money for medicines we don't do that. that's not the point of this it is a illustration of how god's people can be so selfish that within their community there is a widow who is struggling like this why because the leaders have failed and the community has failed why is she in this condition why is she in this condition because the leaders have failed all right the next one first corinthians 3 if you read that passage chapter 3 the whole chapter is about the church read first corinthians 3 the whole chapter read you come to 16 after having read 1 2 3 4 to 15 correct and it's talking about the church it's not talking about your body and people find this verse and say pastors will preach don't harm your body by some bad habits like smoking drinking and all that and yet you know there are other habits like our food and lack of exercise there are also harmful for us we don't talk about those this is not about your body it's about the church 
the church is God's temple. In the context, it's never talked about the body here. By the way, I've given you a reference, 619 is another passage where it does talk about sexual immorality and in that context, he says, don't you know that your body is the, there it specifically says body, not here. So what is the point? Actually, the point is a very big warning to church leaders. Church leaders, be beware. Actually, from verse 10 to 15, it talks about how do you build the church? What kind of material are you going to use? Because God's fire will just vroom, go through that. God will test your building, your ministry as we call it. And then at the end, what will you have? Wood, hay, stubble, it will be burnt. Maybe you have tons of it, but it's gone. But is it going to be precious stones, gold, silver, precious stones? Is it going to be quality rather than just quantity? That's going to be the point of this passage. And so the warning, if you destroy God's temple, what is God's temple? The church. You leaders, it's a warning to leaders, not to ordinary believers, you know, take care of your, don't have this bad habit and this bad habit. It's not just about that. Of course, that everybody knows what these habits can do. Okay, next question. It's just reading the Bible is going to be a simple exercise. How old was Jesus when he began his public ministry? 30 is a good answer. Now look at Luke 3.23. Look at Luke 3.23. By the way, if not for this one verse, we would never have guessed the age of Jesus. You can read Matthew's Gospel, Mark's Gospel, John's Gospel. You will never read about the age of Jesus. This is the only verse where something is mentioned, what does it say? Jesus was about 30 years. So how old was he? No. How do you know he's 29? Why not 28? Why not 27? Why not 36? What does the text say? About 30. About 30 is not 30, okay? So, but it's not a big deal. Come on, hey. No big theological point here, but I'm just making you read that text carefully. Okay, another example. Yeah, this is a good one. Where was Jesus born? In Bethlehem, correct? But where in Bethlehem? Where was he born? He was born in an inn. Okay, which translation do you have? NKJV, okay. It probably will have inn. Anybody else? In those days, where were people born? I was born in a little clinic in North India. Most children are born where? Today, hospital. My, both my children are born in Baptist hospital. Uh, in those days, in time of Jesus, where would children be born? In homes. By the way, they came to their own hometown. And look at Luke 2.6, please. I'm not going to explain the whole thing because it's there in that article. Go online and type that and you'll read the whole thing. What does it say? Luke 2, 6. And so it was that while yeah. they were there. While they were there. Who's is they? Joseph and Mary. And where are they? In Bethlehem. So they have already reached. They don't reach the day they reach and Mary says, I'm going to have a baby. No. That's what our dramas do. That's because we don't read the Bible. And while they are staying on in Bethlehem, with whom? You go to your hometown with who stay with family. If you don't have your own parents there, you'll have uncles, aunties, many people. Correct? You stay with them and while they are there, what happened? The time came for her to have a baby. You think you know, Joseph brings her just when she's going to have a baby? No. So where are they? They are in a home. And Jesus is born in a home like everybody else. And please don't say he was born in a manger. Because a manger is only this much. And give birth in a manger will be pretty uncomfortable. Our problem is we don't know the word manger. For us, manger becomes a big cattle shed and the cattle are lowing the baby. All our Christmas songs add all that. King Jesus was not 
born in a manger. He was laid in a manger. Please don't put Mary into a manger. Okay? So, just simple, just getting to read the text. These are apples, but we need to quickly go to bananas. What is bananas? What are the bananas? All right. How do you eat a banana? Do you eat what you see like that? Ah, you don't eat what you see. In other words, you need to realize there is a covering that has to be removed. So I use this to say, remember that diagram early, that there is a historical cultural covering. There's a historical cultural covering to the text which you and I have to think about. The original readers do not think like that. It's automatic to them. They understand it. So the first example. I think the first example is that of Jesus saying, I am the true wine. Yes, what does that mean? Now, the wine in the context of Jesus, the plant is a symbol of Israel. It's all there in your notes. Psalm 80 verse 8 will say, uh, you brought a wine out of Egypt. What did God bring out of Egypt? Israel. So wine is Israel. Isaiah 5 verse 7. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the household of Israel. So many places in the Old Testament, that's the cultural background. Got it? The wine represents Israel. That's it. So when Jesus is saying, I am the true vine. What is he saying? From now on, I am the true Israel. In fact, a lot of the life of Jesus you need to understand is a fulfillment of Israel. God's plan was to bless the whole world through Israel. Genesis 12 verse 3. So when Israel, the nation, fails, Jesus takes on the role of Israel. So many, 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 many things. Remember when he went to get baptized, what did John the baptizer say? Ayah, not for you. Not for you. This is for sinful Israel. What did Jesus say? You don't understand, John. I am standing in place of sinful Israel. We don't take Christian baptism because Jesus took baptism. We take baptism into Jesus. Jesus stood in place of Israel. So many things. After that, where did Jesus go into the wilderness? Just like, remember, Israel came through the Red Sea and they went into the wilderness 40 years. Jesus went 40 days. It's all about Israel. And so, by the way, it becomes a big problem for people who think about modern Israel as somehow as special. Jesus says, no, I am the true Israel. And you have to be branches in me. Everyone in the world today can be part of God's people. Whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, it's only through Jesus you become part of that true Israel. Okay, so culture. Just the knowledge about the historical, cultural background makes all the difference. The second example, well-known story of the Samaritan, right? As we call it, the good Samaritan. Let me tell you the word Samaritan. I've given you reference there, John 8, 48, is a place where the Jewish people tell Jesus, aren't we right in calling you a Samaritan and demon-possessed? They are trying to abuse Jesus and worse than calling him demon-possessed, a higher abuse is calling him a Samaritan. Samaritan is the highest abuse you can call a Jew. So if you put the word good before an abuse, does it become a good word? That is why to understand Luke 10, you need to know Luke 9. In Luke 9, verse 51 onwards, there's a story that we did not teach us children in Sunday school. At least I didn't learn. Jesus and his disciples are going through a Samaritan village and they don't welcome him with garlands. So what does James and John do? 954. Lord, do you want us to call fire from heaven and destroy men, women, beautiful, cute children, animals? Finish them off. Who's saying that? In that chapter before this, they have been preaching healing people. How come they have this hatred towards Samaritans? Where did they get it from? I say they got it from their mother's breast. They grew up with that. Hatred towards Samaritans. Finish them off. Who do these guys think they are? 
Once you realize how much Jewish people hate, including disciples of Jesus, hate Samaritans, now you're ready to understand this parable. A man comes publicly to challenge Jesus. It clearly says that. He came to justify himself. He wanted to humiliate Jesus before others. His question was to humiliate. Who is my neighbor? Jesus says, okay, okay. I'll tell you a story. After this, you will put your tail between your legs and run. And so this is not a cute story to tell our children in Sunday school. Do something nice for somebody. Jesus is saying, when you enter into my kingdom, remember who's lying on the road? A Jew. His two fellow Jews came by, they didn't help him, right? So who helps him? Samaritan. Previous story we saw, Jews want to kill Samaritans. The disciples of Jesus want to kill Samaritans. Now the Jew is lying on the road. Who is saving his life? If your enemy whom you want to kill saves your life, who is your enemy? It changes your perspective of your enemy. God loves his enemies. That's why he asks you and me to love our enemies. Because he loves his enemies. And by the way, Romans 5 says, we were his enemies. So this parable is a hard parable. Call to love your enemies. That's more than loving your mother-in-law. Okay? It is hard. It's not going to be easy for us. Loving is not a feeling, it's an action. Where you act on their behalf. Sacrificially. Go out of your way. So somebody wants to kill you, you go out of your way to serve them. You want to enter into God's kingdom? This is it. The story is in the context. It's not a cute story about helping your neighbor. Those are nice. Especially, you know, people are very nice to strangers. But what about your enemy who wants to kill you? That's kingdom. All right. Next. Deuteronomy 22 verse 5. Man shall not wear women's clothing. Women shall not wear man's clothing. I mean, in a church like this, it's not a big deal, I know. But I grew up in a church, I'm talking about 45 years ago, and my pastor was very strict. He said, you can't wear trousers. And I believed it. Except that this verse cannot be about trousers. Why? In those days, men were not wearing trousers. So it is not a point about trousers. It has nothing to do with trousers. It has to do with, there has to be, this is going back 3,000 years or more. You know, let there be gender distinctives. So if I wore a sari and came here, it'll be problematic. Right? So there has to be gender distinct. That's all this verse is saying. Nothing to do with trousers. And churches where they used to teach that, they would have a problem because when it's very cold in winter, these old amachis will wear trousers under their saris. So that's because we are not asking simple good questions. Next. What's the next one? Yeah. These things about mixing of things. Why did God say that? Don't wear terlin or mixed clothing. Don't uh, you know, plow with ox and a donkey mixed uh, together. Why? Simple. This was something that the Canaanite culture, they followed. Why did they do this? In their mind, blessings of God came through the gods and goddesses. Do you remember in the Old Testament when you read, you read about the Baals? You heard Baal, and then you hear about Asherahs and Astoreths. Remember that? Now, Asherah Astoreths are female goddesses. Baals, there are many, are male. Now, to be fertile, you have to have male and female come together, correct? We have similar ideas in many cultures, in, including Indian culture. So, what happens? The Canaanites said, if you really want blessing, even when you plow your field, don't plow with two oxen. Two animals, they're different. Why? To represent male and female. So these are fertility practices of the Canaanites. And God is saying, you trust in me. Your wife is not uh, having children. Guess what? Canaanites would say, get a special clothing 
with two kinds of material, mix it and put it on your wife, she will become fertile. Why? Because they are thinking of Baal and I said, now you get it. So it's in that context. Now today, if somebody is wearing terrelin, they are not thinking of becoming fertile. Right? And so this passage, in its context, makes a lot of good sense. What about the food that many of the foods that they were not allowed to eat? Many of them make sense in that context, in that culture, in that climate. Many of these things were not healthy. They didn't have pressure cookers, by the way. So you can cook that meat well. So possibly there are some health hazards. But beyond that, there probably were other reasons. Maybe this animal, the pig, was a favored animal for the Canaanites when they worshipped for sacrifice. So the chances are you grow your pigs for food, you may say, but you'll also be tempted to go to their gods and sacrifice. So, for various reasons, the Israelites were told this. You're not an Israelite living in Canaan. See, that's the problem when we read the Bible. We think every verse, everything must apply to us. May not in the same way. Okay? All right. The next. Yes. What about this stone? Do not move an ancient boundary stone set up by a forefather. Now, Yes, the Bible sometimes words can be used metaphorically. For example, Jesus is called a cornerstone, correct? In Ephesians. What does it mean? Is Jesus a stone? No. It's a metaphor. It's a symbol, right? So, yes, stones can be symbolic, but is it here? Look at Proverbs 23 and verse 10 and 11. Somebody please quickly read that. Proverbs 23, 10 and 11. Do not move an ancient landmark. And don't enter into fields of the fatherless. So now you realize it has to do with land. Why fatherless? Because the father is not there. You want to cheat. You want to take over. He's not coming to fight with you. Next verse. Ah, for their defender is strong. In other words, guess what? Okay, the father may not be there, but God is there. Don't steal another person's land. So the stone here has to be taken literally, not metaphorically. You know, sometimes I may use this verse to say, you know, in our de denomination, in our church movement, we have been following what our fathers taught us and we must follow this. Fine, okay, you want to do that. But this verse is not about following traditions. It's about stealing land. Don't move it. And by the way, this law you'll find throughout the uh, Old Testament in many, many such places. All right. So did you understand the first two levels? What is the first level? What do you mean by that? The literary level. So if you're reading one verse, read the verses before that. Don't just read one verse because remember these verses were number divisions came later. That's the first thing. Just reading the text. Second level is cultural, historical level. We need to know. And usually you'll find answers within the Bible. But now comes the third level. For us, it's a little complicated, little difficult, because it's like opening a coconut. How do you open a coconut? Can you, is it as easy as opening a banana? No. So what do you need when you're opening a coconut? You need some kind of help. You don't use your hand. I'm going to open it up with my hands. No, you don't. You're not stupid enough for that. So you use a knife or whatever and you de-husk it, remove the husk, correct? After that, you still have a hard one. What do you do with that? Karate chop? No. You find a way to break it. You don't break it on your head or something. You use an appropriate instrument. That's it. That's why we all enjoy using coconut. Now, there are sections or aspects or levels of the context of the Bible that you cannot break it on your head. Use an appropriate tool, Baba. That's what God expects you to do it. And there are texts where you need a little help. A good study Bible sometimes will have it. That's all. A good study Bible. If not, I'll give you some other resources. Uh, there is a good Bible commentary or sometimes Google. So let's look at the first example of that. Remember, we looked at John 10, 22. What did it say? The festival of dedication. Now, 
you are not to blame if you are thinking child dedication or baptism or something like that. That's normal because you don't know that level of context. But what really happened, as you can see, is this was a special festival that the Jewish people had. It started around 164 BC. Now, what happened? Just before that, there was a, what was called a desecration of the temple. There were foreign rulers in, in uh, Israel. They were called the Seleucids. There was a madman called Antiochus Epiphanes IV. And he decided to come in because he had the power, came into the temple, desecrated the temple, sacrificed some pigs in the temple, put some Greek gods and all that inside. And you can imagine for the Jewish people temple, they did this. So what happens? There is a revolt. It's called a Maccabean revolt. Have you heard of that? Maccabean revolt. And uh, Judas Maccabees and many of his uh, friends and relatives and others, they started a guerrilla warfare for two years. And guess what? They won. Maybe the Seleucids were busy somewhere else. So they took over the temple. What are they going to do then? Cleanse it. Throw out all these other gods, etc. Right? Cleansed it and they rededicated the temple. Rededicated the temple, now it's 164 BC. By the time of Jesus starting his public ministry, it's about 200 years. For 200 years, they have been celebrating what dedication of? The temple. This is also called Hanukkah. It is at the same time as Christmas. So if you are in the US, you will find this phrase, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Christmas. Same time. What are they celebrating? The temple dedication. Keep that in mind. It's not baby dedication. It's not any other dedication. And why is it not you need help with this? Because it happened between what happened between Old Testament and... Ah, it's not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. So you can't be blamed. You're reading the Bible. It's not there. All you need is little explanation. But John's readers don't need that. You understand? Ah. Jesus' audience doesn't need that. They know it, what it means. You and I need a little help. So, like we use a coconut, we go and take that extra help from wherever it is available. And now understand. Now, verse 36, for example. You know, verse 36, Jesus will say, what about the one that the Father has dedicated? Set apart is dedicated. You know what Jesus is saying? It's huge. Very, 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 very big. We don't get it because we did not know, first of all, what is this dedication. What Jesus is saying, you guys are taken up with this building. And there are other passages in scripture where Jesus will say, by the way, this temple is on its way out. And the temple was destroyed, AD 70. One generation. That's what Jesus meant. This generation will not pass away. This will be gone. And it was gone. Romans destroyed it. And what Jesus is saying, especially in the Gospel of John, chapter 2, remember he says, destroy this temple and I will build it in. What was he referring to? His own body. So when Jesus is there, you don't need a temple. Right? That is what it is. And so he's saying, listen, you people are all excited about this building. This dedication 200 years ago, you started a festival. Good, nice. But let me tell you, but you don't know who the Father has dedicated. That's me. I am the real temple. That's why I remember when Jesus died on the cross, what happened in the temple? What happened in the temple? Yeah, who tore it? God or angel or whatever. In other words, God is saying a statement, the day of this temple is gone because Jesus is here. You don't need a temple. That's why in Revelation 21, 22, it says, and I looked and there was no temple. No temple because God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple. Why do you need a temple when God is with you? And I'm sorry to say, but I need to add this. Therefore, there are many Christians who think, and I believe wrongly, that somehow God is going to build again a temple in Jerusalem. A lot of our brothers and sisters think like that. 
And I think it's missing the point. Jesus is the temple. And then Paul says, we who are in Jesus are the temples of God. There are millions of God's temples all over the world. When we gather today, this is a temple of God. We don't need any more temple to be built in Jerusalem. Wow. Quickly, a couple more things and then we will take a quick break. Now comes a more difficult section of the Bible. Remember, this is like a coconut. You need extra information. We don't need too much information. Extra, a little bit. And now we talk about this whole area of apocalyptic writings. What is apocalyptic writing? It's a style. It's a different genre, right? It's a different genre of writing. Now, for example, you see on the screen an image of people on horses going through blood. This is what is mentioned in Revelation 14, verse 20. That the blood that came up from the trampling of the grapes. Grapes trampling, what are you supposed to get? Grape juice. But suddenly the language changes. It says blood and as high as the horse's bridles. Now, do you think this is supposed to be a literal happening? Is that the point of this? Apocalyptic writing is a different game. Now, all of you, when I showed that image of a man standing like this, no cricket, this is India. But not all of you, if at all anyone knows, know the rules of baseball. Baseball and cricket are a lot in similar, right? Bad ball, so many things. But baseball is different. Now, you cannot apply the rules of cricket when you go into a baseball field. You know, you're playing with some young people, boys, baseball, you walk in and say, can I also play? And you take the bat and you hit and you start running like this. And they will look at you like this, what are you doing? You cannot, you have to learn the rules of the game. Apocalyptic writing is a different ball game. It's very simple, it's not complicated. Book of Revelation was written to ordinary Christians who understood the reason you and I don't understand is because we have not yet learned the rules of the game. That's all. It's not difficult. Numbers are symbolic. Everything, almost everything in that is symbolic. That's all. It's symbol. Jesus is shown in the book of Revelation as a... In the book of Revelation, Jesus is a lamb. We know Jesus is not an animal. We know that. Yet we sing about it. We can transfer that image and we, we can handle it. It's a symbol. So how do we understand 666? Very simple. Before I do that, let me show you another slide about how some people in America, white supremacists, use number 88. You see that man has two numbers tattooed on his head? He's a white supremacist. Who are white supremacists? They believe that America is only for white people. Others, we would like them to leave. And number 14 is because it is a simple 14-word manifesto of one of their leaders, which they believe that America is only for white people. And then number 88, as you can see, is from the letters of the English alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. 8, 8 is H, H. Hail Hitler. Hitler believed in the supremacy of the Aryan race. So why is he got that 88 tattooed? Symbolic of? Come on. Hail Hitler. Now, to understand 666 is very simple in the same way. The next slide will tell you. It's there in your notes. If you write Nero Kaiser, Neron Kaiser. Now, just to help you, there are many places in your Bible where numbers are used symbolically. Uh, and they are based on Hebrew letters. Okay? Now, in your English Bibles, you have Psalm 119. Remember, there are sections of it. There's a Hebrew letter on top. So you will read Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Dalet, He, Wow, Zain, Ket, Teth, Yod. That is 1 to 10. After that, you'll have Kaf, Lamed, Mem, Nun, Samek. So that is 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. It's symbolic, okay? So they didn't have a separate, what we have, numbers, numericals. The letters also served as numbers. By the way, we also do that often, okay? 
for example, you could be saying, let me give you three reasons. A, B, C. What have you done? Used A, B, C as numbers. So, the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, if you write the name of this emperor, Neron Kaiser, you write the letters in Hebrew, put the numbers from Hebrew, you'll get 666. My guess is, and one day I will find out, some clever teenager was playing around on his computer <laughs> and he was playing around with these numbers and he made it and it became popular. By the way, let me use an Indian example used mostly in the north. Charso Bees. Anybody knows what Charso? 420. If you're from the south, you don't know what it is. I mean, if you have not come out too much in the north. What is 420? Charso Bees. Ha, ah, fraud. Where does it come from? Indian Penal Code, 420. So somebody has symbolically taken that and made it a fraud. You know, in Nigeria, it is 419. So in a culture, they can use numbers. After that, everybody uses it. Nobody knows where it is. You can ask a, a slum boy in Bombay, ask him what is the meaning of char sobis. He'll tell you. Where it is it come from, they don't know. They don't need to. Everybody is using it in the culture. 666 is a symbolic way of talking about the Roman Empire. Please leave Elon Musk or even wonderful man like Pope, please leave them alone. Don't show, let us not show our ignorance and being so unfair to do that. So, how do we read the Bible? This is the A, B, and C. Read the Bible. Don't read. Come on, complete it for me. Read the Bible, don't read. Verses. I mean, read it, but make sure you realize, simple, it's part of a verse. That is why a good modern translation will put it in paragraphs. So that each verse doesn't stand out. There are many times when I'm preaching, I look at the Greek text and I say, man, these verses are, you know, there are five verses, but actually one, one sentence in Greek. And if you are only reading one third of it or one fourth of it, you don't get the meaning. You miss the meaning. And that is one of the limitations of King James and NKJV. Because every verse is, a, you know, it's, it's part of a sentence. It's not even getting the point. So don't go with verses, go with the Bible. You got the point. By the way, just please relax. You can use your verses. It's okay if somebody sends you Bible verses, you know. But don't live off that. Read the Bible for yourself. You will get much more from God's living word if you read the Bible and not just read verses. You will miss sometimes some points. And you don't want to miss. You want to get all, right? That's your desire. So while sometimes God may use a stray verse from here and there, God has done that fine, but please read the Bible. So remember there are different levels of context. The first level is like an apple. Just look around. Don't just read the verse, read, look around. You'll get the point, simple. Second level is historical culture. You'll need to know more. You'll need to know more of the Bible. You'll need to know, okay, the wine represents Israel. Now, suppose that morning you had happened to read Psalm 80, and then you read this John 15. You'll say, hey, that place, wine, maybe there's a connection. Sure enough. That's the way wine is used. Jesus is Israel. Thirdly, there are parts of the context that you and I don't know. We need a little help. So if you are from America... And I've done this once in a meeting where I talked about Char Sobis in the north. And there was an American brother there. I said, what do you understand by 420? He's shaking his head. Now, it's not because he's not intelligent or he's not spiritual. It's because he does not know about the culture. Once I explain to him, he gets it. This is what we mean. The scripture is in a context. These are not words that have fallen from the sky and apply every verse equally to us. No. All right. Before we talk about D or durians, I wanted to bring to your attention, and you're welcome to make a note of this, a few 
good resources. I could give you more, but let me not inundate you with resources. But if you are interested, you want to learn, you have to take your own learning responsibility for that yourself. That's adult learning is like that. We have to learn. Uh, it's not going to be fed to us. So one of the books that you can buy on Amazon is 249 rupees. You can buy this. This is a book which was written many years ago by two scholars, a New Testament scholar, Gordon Fee, and Old Testament scholar, Douglas Stewart. Gordon Fee, I look at him as my main mentor. I studied with him here in SABC and also there in, at Regent College in Vancouver. So he is a world-recognized authority on interpretation. Passed away a few months ago, uh, an amazing man of God. He was a Pentecostal scholar. He was also Pentecostal. His father was a Pentecostal preacher. And uh, so uh, uh, please buy this book. This book has been translated into several languages. Uh, once I was teaching in Kyrgyzstan and I used the Russian translation of this book. So if you really want to understand interpretation, you'll have to plot through this. This is not like a storybook, okay? It'll make you think. And God's people must love God with all their mind. Okay? And so get this book, plot through it, read chapter by chapter, discuss Maybe get some friends, three, four of you sit together, read a chapter and discuss. So this is a very good book. The second resource that I want to give to you is a one-volume commentary of the Bible called South Asia Bible Commentary. This, anybody seen this? Okay, one or two only. This is easily available. It is, it may be even less than 1800 there, and it is available from Open Door Publications in Udaipur. Please buy this. If you need help, you can ask Pastor Ramesh, our librarian, and he will get it for you. Uh, we can make it available if you're interested. Somebody can take lists. We can get these books for you. Uh, this is a one-volume book uh, commentary on the whole Bible. I was one of the New Testament editors for this, so I have commentaries of, on John, 2 Corinthians, and Thessalonians, First and 2 Thessalonians in this. So this is an amazing book. You need to buy this for your family and friends. So buy this. It's a good investment. Maybe if you like it so much, you can buy that as Christmas gifts for people. So this is the second. Third is an online resource that I want you to see is what is very well known. Many people, I hope you know about it, is the Bible Project. And uh, the Bible Project is... Uh, Please note, the Bible Project is translating and putting out channels in different languages. So in Tamil and Kannada and Hindi and Malayalam, Bengali and Nepali. So just type that. You can have Bible Project Malayalam, Bible Project Hindi. And several of these, of course, if you understand English, you have more than 300 plus videos that will help you. So any book of the Bible you're reading, let's say Mark, just type Bible Project, go into that this thing, Bible Project Mark, and you'll see a very clear, good uh, outline of the gospel. So this is, and then they have literally hundreds of other videos on themes and topics. So learn, freely available. You don't have to pay for it. All that knows is if you really want to learn, you find the time and you listen and learn. Another uh, resource that I want to give to you, and this is a major resource, is the biblicalelearning.org, write that down. There are hundreds of hours of teaching, hundreds. So if you go onto this website, you have a whole section on Old Testament, New Testament, church history, Bible languages, theology, all that. And you go into, for example, Mark, you may have 20, 30 lectures, one hour lectures on the gospel of Mark. So it all depends how much you want to learn. 30 lectures on the book of Revelation by a very good scholar, Matthewson. So it's up to you. So there are plenty of resources freely available in today's world. It's up to you how much you want time and energy and a desire, intention as you study.